welcome all. Welcome all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking a pause during the festival for uh, trying to hear some uh, different answers to uh, a broad question. Uh, this is a discussion about uh, is there such a thing as a European comics that, as you can imagine, is a very broad question. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the festival and uh, Europe Comics uh, uh, created this opportunity to uh, to give some some clues uh, to I suppose and I hope uh, build uh, fragments of uh, of an answer. Um, I'm Matteo Stefanelli. Uh, I'm the moderator of this talk. I'm from Italy uh, and I'm the artistic director of uh, Comic Con in Naples. Uh, um, one of the main festivals of, uh, about comics in Italy. And uh, there is a long list of guests uh, that I try to uh, invite into the, into the discussion. Uh, um, uh, there is, uh, at the opposite side, uh, Thierry Smolderen uh, uh, from uh, uh, Ecole Européenne Supérieure de l'Image and uh, uh, a comic uh, author. Hmm? Uh, there is uh, Klaus uh, uh, Schikowski, uh, sorry for my accent, uh, from uh, Carlsen, uh, Germany, from Carlsen, Germany, editor-in-chief of Carlsen, Germany. Uh, there is uh, Paul Gravett uh, in, uh, in red uh, from UK, uh, one of the most renowned uh, critic and curator about comics in, in Europe. Uh, there is uh, Tom Aragon. Uh, editor in uh, Dargo. Uh, there is, uh, uh, and sorry again for my accent, uh, uh, Pavel uh, Timoszek uh, from uh, Poland, uh, editor and, uh, and uh, chair of the Association of uh, Comics Publisher in Poland. Uh, and there is from Lion Forge uh, Mike Mike Kennedy, uh, editor uh, of different publishing houses, but recently uh, in Lion Forge from US. So, uh, what I would like to uh, to introduce uh, about this uh, this talk is a, a, um, is a small introduction on on the topic. I mean, we are here discussing something as uh, the European identity of comics. Maybe this is not the luckiest moment in European history eh, to, uh, to talk about European identity. Uh, we live in a um, very uh, complicated time in terms of cultural identities. Uh, but uh, we think it's, uh, it's a very relevant topic. Because it's clearly uh, European comics tradition, something different from uh, the other main uh, tradition of, of uh, comics in worldwide. Uh, everyone has a clear idea about manga culture. Everyone has a clear idea about comics, uh, American comics culture. Uh, European uh, comics culture is something uh, a bit uh, more uh, flow, uh, a bit more composite. Uh, but we know also, and Europe Comics, uh, that, that is our host, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very transparent project about that. We are living in a, in a time of globalization of comics publishing. Uh, that's giving some new opportunities to European uh, publisher and artist uh, to have a global, to reach uh, a new global audience. And what I would like to, uh, to point out are one or two uh, examples about, uh, about the past. Because even if we are here discussing today uh, the struggles and opportunities of European comics, we don't need to forget that European comics has a, a quite long tradition of globalization, even before the globalization of comics publishing in, in the 
last 20 years. Uh, because I'm from Italy, uh, I can uh, underline one example. Uh, during the 50s, after uh, Second World War, uh, Hugo Pratt uh, was invited in Argentina uh, to create comics there from an Italian publisher that moved uh, from Italy because of uh, the Jewish origins. He had to flee uh, fascism uh, and find a new place to live and to make business. Uh, he found Argentina and he started to import uh, comics and import artists, inviting uh, artists from Italy like Hugo Pratt and his uh, friends from the Venice area. Uh, he started a publishing house in Argentina, Editorial Abril, and Editorial Abril was a huge success and it, it started what, what, I, what we can now uh, call the Argentinian uh, comics industry. There was no a comics industry in Argentina before this uh, small European invasion there. Uh, but also during the 60s, uh, uh, some European countries exported uh, in different countries a lot of comics. Uh, we all know the success of uh, Asterix, we all know the success of Tintin and Lucky Luke, but we, we had something more. Uh, for example, in uh, UK, during the 50s and 60s, uh, the non-humoristic non comics publication, the adventure, crime comics, romance comics, uh, war comics, were produced and created by Italian and Spanish studios or agencies. Uh, and also from the late uh, 50s uh, till the 70s, from Spain and Italy, uh, there was a, uh, a European uh, uh, spread of uh, sexy comics uh, and later porn comics. Uh, but we also had different uh, flows uh, of uh, the globalization of uh, European comics before the globalization during the 90s. Uh, for example, uh, um, during the 20s and 30s, one uh, century ago, uh, a lot of uh, comics created and published by Catholic uh, weeklies or Catholic monthly papers were spread all over Europe uh, and the Catholic countries also abroad. So, the question we are facing now is a, a new generation, I think, of, the, of an old question and uh, of an old phenomenon. Uh, European comics were global once, uh, uh, a century ago. Uh, then, something happened. Uh, uh, the non-Franco-Belgian countries, after the success of uh, Asterix, uh, mainly, uh, in the 60s and, and 70s, uh, started to struggle to sell comics uh, worldwide. Uh, maybe we, we can uh, describe uh, some factors uh, uh, to explain this, uh, but that's a fact. Uh, after the 70s, mm, uh, the European identity of comics uh, became more a Franco-Belgian identity of comics, more than before. Even if uh, Corto Maltese uh, was uh, still uh, strong, uh, but not many other non-French, non-Franco-Belgian comics uh, were uh, so strong. Uh, so there's a tradition, there's a history of the worldwide spread of European comics, and now we are in a new phase uh, the phase in which we can uh, finally, uh, finally uh, observe facts uh, in the market, uh, such as uh, the, um, the growth in uh, international rights uh, market from uh, European publisher to the US, uh, some uh, tiny 
uh, internationalization of the rights market uh, uh, in uh, Far East, uh, and the more uh, and the growing uh, translation of European markets uh, in at the border of the uh, oldest uh, 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 European uh, um, continental uh, group of countries, uh, such as. Uh, uh, in Russia, uh, in the Eastern Europe, uh, in the Far Eastern Europe also. So, um, what is uh, in, what inspired this talk is also the activity uh, um, that uh, Dago uh, and uh, a group of uh, European uh, publishers in different countries uh, are doing uh, uh, thanks to the creation of this uh, transnational brand uh, that is Europe Comics that translates in English some uh, books from different countries and, and different partners and try to uh, to, to give uh, uh, to give this title an opportunity to be sold digitally uh, mainly digitally but not only digitally uh, in uh, English speaking countries mainly uh, but it's, uh, it's a new policy, it's uh, a new partnership, uh, transnational, between uh, different uh, uh, Euro European publishers that was never done before. Uh, so it's also a struggle. Uh, and we are here to discuss also the opportunity side and the struggle side of this new, this new phase. Uh, so, my first question to, to stimulate the conversation uh, is uh, the broadest question I have for you. Uh, what do you think uh, uh, about uh, the core elements that maybe uh, we can describe, we can define in the European culture uh, of comics today? Uh, the contemporary uh, European culture of comics is not the same as in uh, as one century ago. It's not the same as during the 60s, etc. Uh, do you think uh, there are some kind of uh, fil rouge, uh, light motif uh, in terms of uh, narrative or in terms of style that in today's market uh, can define uh, European identity of comics? I will start a, a, a tour of uh, answer, maybe starting from the opposite side of the table, uh, Thierry. Sorry for being the first one. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, it's a hard question. I, I'm not sure I can answer it uh, in a proper way. What I I would think maybe, and maybe it's a bit uh, oblique as, a, as an answer, uh, is that the fact that um, the production of comics uh, in, in Europe, at least in, in the Franco-Belgium uh, tradition, is uh, author-oriented. Um, and it's massively author-oriented. I mean by that, that the fact that the authors are uh, the, 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 the first producer of, of the project uh, from the start before presenting it to the editor, uh, to the publisher and uh, in fact the publisher says yes or no to a project but the whole part of a, a creative and a, a, a enterprising uh, um, work uh, as, uh, is done by the authors themselves uh, which means that the, the whole thing is uh, or, or author oriented in, in terms of uh, uh, invention, uh, uh, the, the landscape of possibilities. Uh, it, it's, uh, 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 it's a core issue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is not the case uh, as much uh, in the US or in, the, uh, in, in Asia where it's much more uh, the, the producers are the editors and they are really knowing what they want, they ask for a certain type of product, they have a, def a precise definition of what they, they want uh, uh, and they, they have sc the schools are 
trying to produce uh, uh, artists that are that will be uh, attuned to the the, the want of the the, the, uh, of the publishers, which uh, the, the kind of bizarre. Uh, 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 how to understand or to unify landscape of of of, uh, of the European or at least the Franco-Belgian tradition? I think comes from the fact that the authors are the the, the main producers uh, um, of the comics. So that's what, that that would be my answer. This is really a hard, a tough question uh, to answer. Um, let's say, uh, if you take a look at the French-Belgian comic in the 20th century, you can say um, they, they had this role model, Hergé, who has invented stories which ch uh, which uh, had uh, slapstick on one hand, humor, and adventure on the other hand. And all kind of French-Belgian comics which came after this also had this approach of slapstick and uh, of humor and adventure, the mixture. And uh, I think today um, we have a complete different approach. Um, first, <laughs> we, we left the Winclair. We have a, a lot, uh, maybe we have the greatest variety of drawing styles in, in uh, European comics. And um, it's more uh, content driven. Uh, the graphic novel has um, brought a lot of people to comics who want to, to tell their own stories. Uh, very subjective stories, uh, sometimes very um, based on, on the country where they come from. Other authors are thinking uh, internationally, uh, what can I do? Uh, what kind of graphic uh, uh, story? Um, so I think it's hard to describe or to find a core element which describes European comics right now, because I think uh, the strength, the strength is the uh, variety. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the stat most important things to get clear is the fact that basically France, uh, in particular, but much of Europe, and includes Italy, is very open and receptive to American comics and manga, quite obviously. But the reverse isn't the case, certainly not in Japan, as we know, Japan is not really, doesn't have really need to import American comics or, or European comics at all, with the exceptions of maybe Merv or something like that. Um, and America, of course, has opened a, a lot to manga, not necessarily with the publishers being very happy about it, but it's come and it's unstoppable. Um, but you were talking about how we know what manga is, we kind of think it's defined, but I think that's also a bit problematic because you know, Japan is only part of Asia, the, the whole Asia continent is full of extraordinary variety. If we're only comparing manga, which equals Japan, with comics, which equals the USA, if we're doing that, to Europe, which, we, which is basically, I don't know, 30 countries, maybe one less in a few weeks or so, but it's actually a, a huge variety of European countries where really you can put France and Belgium together, but after that, there are so many distinct things and developments and formats and cultural references that make it very difficult to group it together. And behind all of this, as we know, is that we know what, we think we know, anyway, what manga is. I would contest and the that manga has got way more varieties of drawing than any culture, Japan in particular, than any culture, other comics culture. But and we also think we know what American comics is, because we've talked about the big sort of production line, but of course, as you know, you know, Emil Ferris or Nick Janasso, they're not working to any kind of, they are working in the European way, there are plenty of artists who don't work in a systematic editorial way, so those contrasts are not so clear cut. And I think that the challenge clearly is that we can't really, I don't think, impose on the world this label, Europe Comics, because no one really knows what it means, we don't know what it means, uh, and it has to come down to individual works finding an audience outside of their culture. Um, being, and there's no predicting that. You certainly can't manufacture something that oh, this is going to sell to everybody. It's going to be a global, worldwide success. You could never have predicted that, say, Tantown would become so successful, or Asterix, or Arab of the Future, or many other things. Um, and that's, if that's, that I think is a strength, but it means that you can't very easily define or limit or uh, encompass Europe comics. And that's why the term is a little bit awkward. We know it's, you know, thank you, Europe comics, for sponsoring the panel. We love Europe Comics, doing a great job, 
but it's not going to, no one's going to go, hey, I'm really interested in, in I'm, I'm, a, I'm a manga fan, I'm a comics fan, I'm a Europe comics fan. What is that? It makes no sense at all. That sounds yeah, weird. It doesn't sound like it's going to work. In a way, just briefly, it's a bit like what happened in 2003 when the Koreans were here, the South Koreans were here, and they, as you may know, had a lot of money behind trying to get us all to go, we love manhwa, and, as in Korean comics, and manhwa can be an, a global word like manga. Well, I'm afraid here we are so 16 years later and we're not, basically, and there's hardly anything from Korea being translated in many countries, even in France. So it didn't pay off. You can't impose this kind of label very easily. There we go. The, the struggle side. Huh? Uh, you underline the struggle side. Sorry. Maybe we can address this issue as well with the pop culture side of it. I mean, maybe the, the comics publishing in, in Europe is more book oriented in terms of publishing industry. Way more than in the US or in, or in Japan or in Asia where it's more newsstand of. I, I don't know how. Yeah, maybe not more. Equally, equally, equally yeah. newsstand. Yeah, but, but it's massively book oriented. The market, the market in Europe is, is it's a book oriented one. So it's 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 very interesting in terms of how you can propose almost every everything that you save, and um, and it's kind of a weakness as well because you have to reproduce, to find something new. You can't you can't have just like you have your superheroes. You can have a Batman thing forever uh, with movies, etc., etc. We have we are more than probably any, anybody else a, a prototype industry. In, in terms of publishing, uh, I'm not talking about art or anything, it's just how you publish books or, or floppy comics or something every two months. So for us it's one book a year. So it's, it's a huge difference, I guess. Oh, yes, I mean, I think the American market is very complex and as you described, there's almost like two completely separate markets. The book market, like you say, that's all the, the bookstores where they mostly sell the graphic novels, where you'll see collections of, common, you know, five issues of Batman collected into one. Um, but the other half of the market is, we call it the direct market, and that's where you sell the floppy comics. And at least half of the direct market is Marvel and DC. So not only is it very genre and superhero oriented, but those are also company-owned characters. So whereas uh, Thierry was saying, you know, in France and in Europe, it's very author-centric. So authors are bringing their characters and ideas to the audience. Um, in the American direct market, like I said, more than half of it, those are characters that belong to Marvel, DC, Disney, Lucasfilm. Um, there are, of course, original creations. You know, most of the image books are owned by the authors, but that is a, that's a relatively small portion of the comic book audience and the comic book market in America. Um, the book market is definitely growing. They're becoming more and more open to graphic novels. And so you are seeing a lot more of those original creations sold in bookstores, but that's a growing process that is, I mean, it's been growing for 20 years and it's still growing today. And it's, you know, it does not, doesn't even come close to the current, um, state of European book market sales. Just a brief note that you may not be aware, I was talking to a publisher last night from Bliss Comics. They're a French publisher who have the license, they're quite small, the license for Valiant comics here in France. And what's, what he was telling me is that basically several people have tried selling um, American comic books in the trade paperback, the floppy paperback, so the paperback format. The French market doesn't want that. They have to be in hardbacks. And you're, you work with Urban, is that right, I think? so. That's true, it has to be a hardback, but that's a very distinctive thing that the French, and Belgium, I guess, but the French market especially has, is that hardback fetishism, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, that's another different differentiation in the States between the direct market and the book market is the direct market is almost, those are like periodicals, and those are, I mean, they're floppy, and frankly, they're kind of disposable. It's like, this is my monthly comic book, I'm done reading it, most people probably collect them, but I mean, you can't just throw them away. It's the books that are on bookshelves. Those will stay on shelves for years. So the comic book is really only going to stay on a shelf for a month, maybe two months. So uh, the book market, 
and for the publisher is the most valuable part and, and the most important. But the floppy comics are still where we get the most attention because people are people are seeing your title every month, so it becomes more of a, a habit and a recognized title. But really, that recognition is meant to sell them the book eventually. Okay, when I hearing uh, all of you, uh, I have one meaning in my mind that uh, European uh, comics has one core uh, it, that idea I am born uh, now, one core thing. This is uh, originality. Uh, European uh, comics market is uh, very original and open, still developing, because we are uh, more, much more open on artist, on uh, story than on product. And I think this is uh, when uh, I listen to you and I started uh, thinking about that. It's the main uh, core trait of the European comics that we have uh, open market and still developing and uh, still trying to find some art, artist in that, not uh, only product. Yeah, I agree. And w what is interesting too, maybe, is that uh, I, I totally agree with, with, with what you're saying, is that if you take the, the, the European comics that has been the most uh, translated in the world, the last maybe 10 years, you have Persepolis, so it's a French book, uh, drawn and, and written by an Iranian woman. You have probably Black, Black Sad, so it's a French book as well, but the artists are Spanish. Uh, you have, uh, help me, uh, what, what were the, the big successes? Riyad Satouf, who is a Franco-Syrian, a, a French uh, artist about a Syrian story. Etc. Etc. And Hugo Pratt was Italian, that, uh, and he was his success was maybe helped a lot by the French publisher. So that, that that's maybe the the, the the best European tradition is welcoming foreigner artists and writers, and to allow them to be as free as possible in terms of creativity. Well, and I think I, I'm sorry, it's not I'm, I'm the French here, so I'm, 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 I'm very pretentious. Sorry. Well, I think uh, at least uh, uh, on the American side, and only only from my experience, um, I think that's one of the exciting things about the changes we're seeing now is even though in America we are still we're we are constantly fighting a battle to educate the readers that there are so many excellent comic books, graphic novels that you know the American reader is still not used to sequential art. There is there are comic book readers. And then there are book readers and graphic novels, and I think a lot of French and European uh, graphic novels are comic books for book readers. And so we're kind of fighting the battle where we're trying to educate book readers to now read their books with sequential art. And so the books that we've brought over from France and Italy and Spain, etc., I think those have been great introductory things that are that are helping to to grow that audience. Um, but it, it, you know, it's a constant, it's a constant growth. And so I think the more we can bring over, the more American readers will realize that it's not just superheroes, it's not just sci-fi fantasy, it's not just young teen high school uh, sword and sorcery stuff. Like you can find books about anything. Like if I were to find, if I were to try to, to describe what makes European comics different from manga or American comics, is while manga has a very distinct visual style, a lot of variety within that, um, and American comics have a very distinct visual style with variety in that. European comic style is its lack of style. There is every type of visual style, narrative style, topic. Uh, genre, I mean, you can find historical biographies, you can find political thrillers, you can find, you know, detective stories, you can find just personal dramas, like any type of story you can imagine is being published in Europe. And that's not true in America right now. There's a lot, the variety is growing, but it's still not nearly as diverse as the types of stories you'll find in European comics. 
let's talk about uh, readers. I mean, when when we talk about the uh, globalize the, the export of European cinema, for example, thinking about the U.S. market, during the second uh, post-World War years, there was a, a boom of uh, European cinema uh, exported in, uh, in the art cinema uh, uh, venues in, in the US. And the, uh, the audience of uh, these, these movies uh, that attended the, the art cinema halls, art cinema theaters, found um, they really liked European cinema because of some core uh, elements that now we know thanks to the history of cinema. Uh, European cinema in the US were, uh, uh, um, were really a la mode uh, because of two elements. Sexiness, transgression and sexiness, and exotism. Mainly, huh? I mean, mainly. Uh, do you think, uh, and that's the, the story of uh, Bernardo Bertolucci and uh, Bergman, etc., etc., etc. What kind of feedback do you have uh, from readers abroad, uh, from US or uh, abroad from Asia, when when you have feedbacks from readers or your or your partners, maybe not publisher that uh, that buy rights. Uh, What's the main interest uh, they, they have uh, or they perceive from uh, European comics? If you have um, any feelings. I would say it's just like being in a bookstore, in a comic bookstore, you just look at the art first. So it's probably the art, being very detailed, very generous, a lot of panels per page. Um, you have some names coming again and again forever, like Moebius, of course, and Pratt, and etc. So, some, some artistic models for other artists, I would say, maybe that's the first thing that comes to mind, I don't know, Paul? Uh, I think it's also, also difficult to answer. Um, I try to give an example. Uh, we have this German artist, his uh, Reinhard Kleist, and he's, uh, I think he's, in the meantime, he's internationally well known. Uh, his books are published in every country from us. And um, Reinhardt has his approach now. He doesn't want to tell stories which takes place in Germany because he says, "Oh no, uh, I, I'm not doing comics for for German uh, for German readership. I would love to do comics for an international readership." So he's always searching for topics which um, which have, have more than this nationality, you know. And and he always distinguishes, uh, like he has done the, the the case. And then he said, uh, "Ah, fantastic! I have told a story about uh, refugees, and I had a, a very clear style. But now with Nick Cave, I can be very expressive because Nick Cave, uh, his songs, um, they, they have this aggression, and uh, so Reinhardt always uh, searches a subject um, in a different way." And I think this is an interesting thing which readers are, are looking for. Not is there any German thing in, in it, or uh, can can we adapt it? This one for our country also. From my mind, Polish view, it's uh, much more difficult because uh, not so many Polish comics as was published uh, in all Europe. There is. Uh, is uh, Samples on one hand of uh, year on uh, my hand only, and maybe three, four books, uh, and we still trying to show our books uh, to other European countries uh, audience. But uh, when uh, people uh, finally see some uh, Polish comics as uh, abroad uh, in some uh, magazines or as a book, they always telling one thing: this is uh, some different kind of stories than usual for our market, and uh, very good quality of art. And uh, this is why uh, so many publishers from France or from US uh, taking some artists from Poland and uh, giving them job and do, for doing uh, comics in uh, their style, in their uh, kind of uh, comics. 
I, I just want to add that one of the things that, and maybe we're contributing to the problem, but uh, one of the things that we um, try not to do when we are uh, promoting one of our translated books is we don't promote it as here's this cool French comic that we translated, here's this cool Spanish comic. We just say, here's this cool comic. And then maybe in creator interviews or, you know, some sort of in the details of the press, it may be uh, made evident that, you know, this is originally published by Dargo or something like that. Um, but we actually try not to emphasize that this is a European comic just because we want the work to stand on its own. Um, also because, well, because the, what defines a European comic is so nebulous that in America, any, a, a, lot of, a lot of the audience might just tune it out. Like they might just think, oh, that's heady European stuff. I want a comic book. Exactly. Well, that sounds, like, that sounds like a European art movie, if you say that. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Maybe I'll put it yeah, like, oh, that's And also, as we have to say, I mean, we're talking about Tintin, Asterix being popular, I mean, they are not popular in America. Basically, are they? So, I mean, uh, there hasn't, they haven't, you can't say in the tradition of Tintin or Asterix, you know, as being a successful American, you know, popular characters, they're not. And for me, this is a mind uh, and only right uh, point of view. Uh, we're speaking about comics, yes? and we're speaking about good comics. Yes? Comics is good, not Polish, not uh, French, American, Japan, or other. It's always good comics or not good comics. Well, of course we agree, and everyone can sign a, a manifesto. Uh, of course, uh, I think everyone in the hall. So, uh, of course, this is not the... Uh, this is correct, but but readers, some communities of readers uh, doesn't have the same way of thinking, huh? because we know a lot of co uh, communities that think uh, in terms of uh, uh, geographical cultures of comics, huh? because we know in every country uh, communities of readers that uh, they don't read comics, they read manga, or they don't read manga, they read comics. Uh, so that's one of the uh, struggle I think Europe uh, publisher and artists have uh, because the greatest uh, communities of readers still think in terms of geographical uh, production or culture. So, but I think I, I will um, uh, spend uh, five min minutes more uh, thanks to Klaus that uses a, a very uh, powerful uh, case history, uh, uh, thanks to Reinhard Kleist uh, books. Because it, um, I, I think uh, Klaus uh, cited, uh, mentioned uh, a case of uh, an individual artist that thinks um, transnational, uh, that thinks uh, global mm, uh, in terms of project. But his, I, I his, his next project, his next project is going to be on. Is it a secret? The next project of Kleist? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's David Bowie. Bowie. David Bowie. So David after Bowie. Yeah, after yeah. Um, Nick, uh, Nick Cave, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a global name. Is it you can announce something more. Uh, no, his next project will be about uh, the boxer Emil Griffiths. <laughs> but comes after it. He just wanted to do a, a small thing. Uh, Emil Griffiths has uh, was a homosexual boxer, and he has uh, um, uh, somebody died because of him, and uh, so it's a really interesting story and. That's his next project in September, and after it. But I thought three, three, three guys are doing Bowie at the same time, Mike Allred and yes. Okay. Okay. Not, not, not too many details. Not too many details today. There, there are rooms and booths uh, to discuss details. Uh, but um, this is an individual artist uh, case. What I will ask uh, mainly to to the editors and publishers here, here. Uh, this vision, uh, such as Reinhard Kleist, uh, uh, a transnational vision of, uh, of, uh, of a book, um, is something you as a publisher also try to build or not? Uh, when, you, when you create a, a project uh, uh, and your mission is also to sell the rights abroad, of course, uh, not always, but it's a mission uh, of the company. Uh, do you think uh, uh, in recent years, uh, publishers and you, 
uh, are trying to think more in this uh, direction or not? Uh, are you investing in creating uh, European uh, comics that ha can have uh, an international audience or not? Do you think you uh, do it enough or not? I would, I would love to. I try. Um, but as we've heard, uh, it's very author-driven, and uh, every publisher knows his authors. They have, they have ideas, and uh, whether you like it or you like not the idea, some authors you can talk to them and argue with them and saying, okay, let's take another topic. Maybe this is too, too not broad enough, and so on. Um, but Reinhardt, he, he comes from his own with his ideas. He has the thinking. I would love to, to make more international projects, but it's always depending on the author. Yeah, I, I would love to say yes, but I think it's very difficult to have to have a good book firsthand. So it's just one parameter among so many others. I mean, first we try to have a good story and some good art and some good pages and a good and a nice and nice design and printed and and distributed and, 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 and publicized uh, book. So, yes, we, we always hope that the foreign rights would be very good for this particular one, particular book, but it's just one parameter among, among, among other. So, so as, as Thierry is here, so when we, when we worked on the Souvenir de l'Empire de la Tome first, which is kind of a success abroad in terms of, of languages, um, of course, I had I had some somewhere in my mind. I, I, I had the idea that it could be successful in a, a world, but it was very difficult to have a, a, yeah to foresee it, but first to have a, to be successful enough in France and and, and Belgium. So, uh, but we keep that in mind, of course. When we when, when I when I have a, a project which is clearly a, a, a graphic novel, as we have to call it now. Uh, yes, we, we hope that it will be successful. Uh, and so mostly it is. I mean, that's something that our own foreign white department is uh, expecting from us. Having more graphic novels because it's easier. So now the trend is non-fiction comic books. Okay, so should I do more non-fiction comic books because it's successful abroad? Sorry, Sophie, but uh, it depends. <laughs> Maybe if I can summarize uh, Klaus and Thomas' uh, opinions, um, I, I think you, you give more um, elements uh, of strength to the theory small than in first position, eh? I think. Uh, you are describing a, a, a policy uh, that depends a lot on the individual ideas of artists, of authors. So maybe this is still again and again uh, a core uh, trait, a uh, core cultural element of uh, European comics. And uh, maybe Thierry, do you, do you, can you maybe answer at, uh, to the same question, but uh, to, from your uh, author point of view, when you create a book, do you think uh, uh, transnationally? Do, do you do you think uh, of a non-local uh, uh, ima imagery and, and narration style? I actually, yes, uh, because I have the uh, the experience of having books published in in the States, for example, for, for a long time. The Gypsy series was published by uh, Heavy Metal in the in the early 90s and um, so there are two two um, opposite di direction direction in which I I think uh, about the, the possible translation uh, one is to globalize uh, for example Gypsy is typically a, a, an adventure science fiction story that that is not geographically uh, uh, um, marked in, in any way uh, this is also the case of Ghost Money, uh, which might be published in the States. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I would never uh, write a, a script that would happen in the States uh, uh, if I had not uh, a clear idea of what I would bring 
and to the to the, the story as a European writer, uh, a link uh, to Europe in, in any ways. For example, uh, 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 Souvenir de l'Empire de l'Atome. Uh, okay, it starts in the States uh, with an American hero, but it comes to Belgium and to the uh, exposition, uh, uh, the international exhibition of 58. And uh, I, have, I have a personal relationship with that uh, that uh, event, event, uh, uh, and, and and the others. I mean, the the, the, the graphic novels I, I, I write for uh, uh, Alexandre Cléris. Uh, I I really believe that the French touch. I mean, the the, 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 the fact that it happens in, in the, on the French Riviera or uh, uh, the next one is a. Uh, in a very small village in, uh, in France uh, would be uh, an advantage uh, in terms of translation because it is uh, it's, it's, it's cute <laughs> it's nice it's uh, typically French uh, and it works uh, uh, so there are two opposite di direction uh, uh, going global or going very local uh, I have, I have uh, the last question before maybe uh, asking you all if you have some, some more to ask. Uh, because we are here thanks to Europe Comics that's challenging us uh, with a very com complicated question. Uh, also because they, uh, this is a, a challenging project in terms of uh, policies. Uh, my question is, it's clear that the European panorama of comics uh, publishing is very fragmented, very composite. Uh, do you think it's, uh, it's a barrier to the internationalization of uh, European comics, this fragmented identity? Uh, because we don't have a, a, um, a a European body of publisher association of comics. We don't have a, a European Union coordination of cultural activities for comics publishing. So, uh, do you think this fragmented identity is uh, uh, still a strong barrier or not? And do you think we can turn it in, in, in some opportunities, thinking also in a in a in a political in a uh, uh, in a pol in political activities or or challenges to to share between stakeholders in comics publishing. Of course, it is the, the, the Europe comics the Europe comics initiative is very important. It, it's I mean, if you compare to the the funding the, the public funding by the European Community uh, to comics with the cinema industry I mean and if you have in parallel the the, 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 the power of the Japanese and, and the American uh, pop culture uh, starting from comics if you see the if you see the, the, the link between comics then movie in terms of business it's a shame that the European community haven't done anything before I mean when you have we, we know how after the Second World War, the U.S. Uh, government started a soft power, uh, powerful uh, uh, movement, uh, putting a lot of money into that because the culture. If you want to be, to, if you want to rule, it starts with culture. So that's very interesting that the, that the European community started with Europe, Europe, uh, Europe comics uh, funding because if you have one. Probably, to, to, to speak in terms of, uh, of IP, uh, it could become a movie, a license, something that can bring a lot of money to all the actors, starting from the authors, etc., and, and, and start a, 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 a circle virtue, in, in a circle virtue. Uh, so, yeah. so, no, that, that, that's very important. That's very important. So, I, I hope it will. Yeah, we keep going on. I, I, to, to your point, you actually mentioned how you know there. Are, I mean, when you say European comics, we're actually talking about many different cultures, and I'm only speaking as a buyer here, not as. I mean, uh, 
I, I don't really see any barrier that we've had to face when we're dealing with Italian publishers, Spanish publishers, French publishers. I mean, it shows like this makes it very easy for a buyer to meet everybody and find the material. I mean, we've published a lot of books from Italy and Spain and France, um, most of which were either found at the show or the contacts were made at the show. So I don't, from a buyer's perspective, I don't know if having everybody organized into one unionized group would make it any different for us. I think, I think the issue is probably more a matter of whether you guys would have more benefits on your side of the fence. But as a buyer, it's, it works pretty well right now. <laughs> Uh, as a seller from the small country in Europe, not so big market like uh, French or uh, Italian or Spanish, I, I will tell that it's uh, very difficult to uh, show our stuff to American uh, or other big uh, comics market because uh, we still must uh, show much more better works than uh, French uh, publisher or uh, Italian uh, or Spanish publisher. So uh, maybe uh, cooperation between the uh, European comics market must support to smaller uh, comics market and uh, support to showing the things from uh, Turkey, Poland, Germany uh, to bigger audience. I also think that uh, the main point is the cooperation also in Europe comics, but um, in Germany we, we had the luck, uh, thank you very much, uh, to do a uh, German Spirou. We have done a Spirou in Berlin uh, by a German artist called Flix, which was fantastic because we the, the brand Spirou isn't that well known in Germany. We don't have the comic culture like we have the comic culture in France, so we have to establish a culture. And uh, I think all these cooperations are Grow, coming together, uh, are growing right now. We are on, on our way. Um, and uh, ask us again in, in five years, maybe then, then we can tell you more about the European comic. Uh, but I think the cooperation is, is uh, very important to say, okay, here's Peru, you can do a German Peru, you can do a British Peru or whatever. Um, so let's, let's work in this way. I think this is really, really important for the future because we had a great success with Peru in Berlin. And I'm really, really glad to, to have the opportunity to do a thing like this. It was important for the German comic, but it was also important for the French Belgian comic in, in Germany. Yes, I think you're speaking very good, and this is why we uh, trying to work together. Not only me as a publisher, but other publishers from Poland. Uh, we start uh, working together, and this is why in the same place, in a half hour, we'll be meeting about Polish comics. So I'm inviting everybody on that meeting too. Yep. So actually, to that point, uh, that does bring up one thing coming from the buyer's side is I think this does actually start to discuss one thing that I do think is a very strong opportunity that I, at least I haven't seen that much of in the States and I think there's a lot of opportunity for it, which would be co-publishing or co-production um, where English and French or Italian or German or Italian uh, stories and books are created with the intention with an American partner with the intention of we're going to publish the, this thing internationally at the same time. Like that's not something that I've seen. Auditions, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for that that just haven't really been explored. Does that, that, that happen? Yeah. It, it doesn't seem to happen. So I, can't. I imagine this, the Spirou in Berlin did. Yeah. That was a, a co-edition, obviously, done, well, maybe not, obviously. <laughs> We've done it alone and it will be published uh, in a few years in France. Yeah. I think it might be, it, might, it, it probably is easier to co publish within Europe because you're printing in the same continent. In and theory, but does it, does, if it doesn't happen, then why doesn't it happen? Yeah. That would seem obvious. Uh, how, how many languages were printed for the Lucky Luke at the same time? Six, seven? Five, sorry. Yeah. So five. So, and, and Asterix must be. It must be UK, but yeah, yeah. still two or three. One, one could imagine that more author-driven or more less sort of massive brands, as, as, as Asterix, for example, could also benefit by having a co more cooperation amongst publishers to say, well, co-initiate and co-publish. 
in the new project. Especially, you see, this could sell in our country as well as your country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking especially if it's an opportunity to bring it into English, since yeah. I mean, too. that ocean divide does seem to be one of the harder ones to break. So if partnerships could happen to bring things over across the Atlantic ahead of time, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. So that almost sort of cuts down the buying the rights a year later or two later as you actually go in November. We're going to do this all at the same time. The printing costs are much lower and the promotion costs are all, all tied in. Yeah, there, might but, be, there might be additional shipping and freight sure. issues, but I mean, it makes cost everything else could save. There are going to be new books that and and authors people will, every country will want to do yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah. The challenge I still want to raise though is that I, that you, I don't think you can very easily promote Europe comics as a brand or as some kind of I'm a Europe comics fan. I mean, I, there's no one's wearing a badge like that. Um, and the other issue, I suppose, is that even this festival I'm finding is, uh, is creating this kind of tribal approach to the comics landscape where you have to traipse all the way out to Manga City, and then when you're there, you're not going to really going to come back into the town and go to some other, other part of the comics world. So you go to the bit that you like. And I think we'll all probably agree that, as we've said, good comics come, can come from everywhere. There's no one country that's better than another. Um, but the real problem is that people tend to kind of fixate on I'm into manga, I'm into superheroes, and I'm not going to look at anything that isn't that. And we all want people to kind of just have a more open, receptive interest in finding good stories wherever they may come from, even maybe in styles that we're, they're not used to. That still needs a lot, of, a lot of work on, I think, to try and bridge those. So actually segmenting, because it's really, it is, we are facing essentially still, essentially a war of pop culture, uh, it's a battle of images, a battle of pop culture. It's America versus Japan with kind of Europe stuck in the middle, basically. <laughs> yeah, everybody else is sort of trying to get the bits that are left over. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, to talk about. It's very interesting because we, we talked a lot about the US. But for me, the most important market, it's Europe. It's not, it's not, it's not America. It's, it's just the American dream of, for any a European is having a success in the US. But no, I mean, we, can, we, we, we make a very good business in Europe with, with our books, and that's very, very important, and it, it probably the first thing that, I, that I'm thinking about when I have a project. In, in all honesty, there are, I mean, I've met and worked with so many amazing uh, European authors, and they're all so excited that their book will finally be available in America. And I, right, and then, I, and then I tell them that, you know, well, we're still working on the audience, uh, but, yeah, there's the difference between the perception and the reality, but we're working on the reality. If I was a journalist, uh, I, I, I would like to summarize uh, uh, this discussion as maybe Europe comics is less a brand and more an attitude, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, but uh, from your last round about co-production, uh, this is, uh, anyway, uh, an area in which building platforms, uh, uh, it's, it's a future struggle very relevant. Uh, because we know the, the, the importance of co-production platforms. I mean, festival, fairs, meetings in TV and in cinema industries. In, fest, in, uh, in comics, we, we still don't have this, uh, this context uh, in, uh, in Europe. So maybe... This is, uh, anyway, uh, a very important challenge. Uh, I, I suppose this collaboration uh, and this uh, project, Europe Comics, could, uh, could really help uh, in the future. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to maybe ask some professional to... to ask five, minutes. five minutes? Maybe one question here and the second question there. Um, I live in Canada, in Vancouver, and um, but I'm from the UK originally. So I, I got so, so, sorry, the, the microphone. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Be close. So um, coming from the UK and going to Canada and going to the US, um, you're, in, you're you're overwhelmed by American comics, really. Um, but I think the big problem is that people haven't really made the effort yet to change the minds in America. I don't think you're going to do that at comic conventions because comic fans are comic fans. They're not going to, you know, 
stop buying Thor and going to watch the movie. That's not going to happen. I think you've got to try and change your approach. I think that if you were attending uh, colleges and universities or expositions at colleges and universities, for the kind of material that's being produced in Europe, you'd, you'd have more resonance. Um, I also think that it's literally beyond belief, and I'm, I'm hearing it now from you guys yourselves, that you don't have an association. I, I can't believe that that hasn't happened. Um, and I think, you know, there's a big opportunity to do it. I think you, you really need to get together, and you really need to focus your efforts to try and, and um, break through in America and increase the diversity in Europe and bring in, you know, thoughts and, and you know, opportunities from Poland and even beyond there. So I, th I think you, uh, you've got some work to do, gentlemen. Good suggestions. Uh, <laughs> also, not only uh, interesting question, but also suggestions, uh, no? Uh, as you may know, I mean, I know uh, you're involved with the Napoli Festival, but Claudio Puccio, I saw in the audience, was involved with a, a project for quite a long time. There were secret meetings here at Oculet over several years with comic festivals, trying to organize a, a group, just a network of the festivals, a network which didn't take off, didn't happen. Um, and certainly Angoulême doesn't want to be part of that festival network because Angoulême is a network in itself. Angoulême is its own network and doesn't necessarily want to collaborate that much, but uh, that is needed for a start. But then bringing beyond, beyond the festivals, bringing the industries, the publishing representations from each country together, that seems an obvious thing. And here I am from Britain suggesting that we have a kind of EU of, of, of comics. Uh, I'm certainly pro-EU, but um, uh, yeah, we do need that. I think it could be a very productive thing, which maybe Europe comics can take a, a lead on and see how you can develop that, maybe get funding for it, so you have a multilingual website, at least that, that could be set up the network for projects to collaborate with touring exhibitions from festival guests from the country. That surely is possible. We're in 2019. The major the feature sphere. Yeah, 2019. The, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the, the, the microphone volume was, was enough good to the, to make uh, every everyone uh, hear clearly the, the first uh, question also, uh, also the, the uh, Mr. Mr. Um, asked us uh, that's about uh, college and university as a much more important uh, venue and target than comic convention in US. That's really super interesting, I think. It, but it reminds me of what, that's what Stan Lee, of course, was doing when he was building the Marvel brand in the 60s. He went on college tours all across yes. America. Pushing yes. Marvel direct to students. Yes. That was before comic novels. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But, it's but I think both are important. Uh, when I was uh, in New York two, three years ago on uh, New York Comic Con, we have a meeting on uh, Columbia University too with the artist about his book. And yes, the audience uh, was really impressive. But on comics uh, festival, that was too. So, uh, when we do only directly one uh, way, it's not good. We must uh, try to many ways uh, to show comics uh, to the world public. And also this reminds me the lack of European cinema also uh, during the, the, the war years because exactly thanks to college, art, uh, art theatres and university art theatres, uh, Europe had a, a distribution channel uh, a, a quite strong distribution challenge in US, so uh, that's something real, but this is exactly something that can happen only uh, within a coordinated way of, uh, of uh, traveling abroad, uh, I think. This is a good idea, but also very complicated challenge, because we can't go in 100 colleges and universities without an association, without a uh, a collective body. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, time out. We have well, maybe only one minute. Uh, if someone wants to add, no. We 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 have not not enough time for uh, for the last question. We have okay. Uh, hello. The microphone very close. Very very close. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is more more or less related with uh, this issue. Is uh, more very very close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, we noticed that there is a problem uh, in audience in audiences. I mean, to, to to find new audiences. So do you think something uh, additional must be done beyond the market inertia? I mean. For example, governments should get more involved, or what? What is your position about it? Because it's a problem of audiences. We we hear here in France that there is a problem of overproduction. So we we start to hear that, and it's it is strange because we are used to hear that comics in general are not so consumed in the in the in the general we would say cultural market. So that's the question: how, how to what? What can be done additionally to find these new audiences? And How to develop new audiences? Yeah, and who should who should get involved in that? Beyond uh, editors, beyond market actors. I mean, if you're talking about in the United States, I mean, I can tell you right now, the government will not get involved. <laughs> the government's merely getting involved in things they need to be getting involved in. Um, as far as uh, what we do to get uh, our European comics out to new audiences, and we're just one publisher. I mean, there's European comics coming from a dozen different American and English language publishers. So um, to get all of those publishers coordinated to sell books together, that's also probably going to be a very impossible thing because everybody's out for themselves. Um, but what we do is, um, at least many of the books that I've published, um, appeal to like art school students and animation students and like you know visual effects you know storyboard artists and concept artists so we've built a very strong audience of what i would call taste makers people who have fans of their own so like if this guy this animator likes our book then other people will discover it through them so that's one route that we kind of take to introduce these materials to new, at least American readers, um, but it is a matter of finding those, finding those books, and you know, really taking advantage of those those opportunities. Um, but yeah, it, it can get complicated. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we we are 10 minutes late. Even we if we start at 10 minutes late, so uh, we are relieved. Uh, uh, so. Thank you, thank you all, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, our guest and Europe Comics that hosted this. Thank you all.